Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and welcome to part two of my gong series. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, some things that we didn't cover in that first episode. Uh, mostly we'll get a little bit more into the mallets and the playing uh, utensils here. We'll talk about mounting the instruments as well as notation of the instruments. We'll also talk some more about bowing. So the first thing I want to talk about is how I mount all this stuff, which is a whole sort of problem in itself. So when I was a kid, I was into these things called erector sets, and I just loved to play with those all day. My mom used to tell me she couldn't get me out of my room. I build all kinds of extravagant devices and keep getting more and more of these little pieces of metal. So I was always into this kind of thing, building things, and I still am. Uh, so that made putting these kinds of racks and things together really simple. So there's a couple ways to go about it, and certain ways are more expensive than others. So the first way is to basically go online and buy a bunch of parts. So uh, I would recommend the Gibraltar parts. They make really good hardware. And what you're looking for is kind of drum rack systems. So in other words, you need the pipes, which are these. Okay, I have different colors. These are all Frankenstein from different keyboard rigs and some electronic drum rigs and, and all that. Uh, but you want to buy a bunch of pipes and you want to get some really long ones. So the longest ones I have, which I believe are about 72 inches, uh, you can always cut them down with a hacksaw. It's really, really easy. So buy a bunch of those and I would get a lot of long ones first and then you can cut them down. And then you might want to get some 36s, so half of that. Uh, what you're looking to do is make uh, rectangular racks. And then you can buy some shorties if you want. They're not as useful, but I do use them for things like making these little stand racks where I can mount a tray for these mallets. I put these on a clamp. You see one. Probably it's not coming out in the camera, but you see one right here. Okay, so that's what um, I recommend doing. And you can cut off of those six-foot pieces anything you need. And it's cheaper to do it that way. Now, I would buy the black color. Uh, it doesn't reflect light as much as the silver stuff. I just had this from an old, any silver shiny ones you see are from an old Roland uh, drum rack when I used to use some electronic drums for some projects. All right. The next thing after you do that is to get the clamps. So you'll need three or four kinds of different clamps. The first kind is the connector clamp uh, and I'll post some pictures so you can see them close up but it's got a hole for the pipe to go in and then a hole for the pipe to go through and you can use these in a number of ways uh, but you need you're going to need a lot of these so if you want to make one gong rack I would buy at least eight of them okay uh, you know they're a little bit expensive but that's that's the way you're going to do it so again, this is the expensive way to do it, but it's going to be a little more reliable than the second way I'm going to tell you. The next kind of clamp is the um, utility clamp, and you can use this for two things. So these are common for electronic drum racks. So you put the pipe in here, this, the big hole there, and then the little one is adjustable for other kinds of things like this. So this is where your electronic drum would go, but also it's great for hanging gongs. You see back here, I took this gong off, but that's what I'm using there and all kinds of other things. So that's a real plus. So you probably want to get about eight of these and maybe eight of these. OK, and then you can get a few of these adjustable clamps. These are much more expensive, so they have sort of a ratchet. And you can use these to mount cymbal arms, boom arms, uh, for lighter gongs and cymbals. And then you can tilt them. So you don't have to get this. It's an extra. It'll be your most expensive clamp. So you can get a couple of those. Finally, if you want to hang a lot of small gongs like this, you're going to need this uh, pipe hanger. So Gibraltar makes these as well. And there's... They come with this long hanger there, but I use these little curtain rod hangers 
all right uh, because you get the gongs closer this one I find is too big and these are super cheap you can get those online for nothing basically a couple bucks for about you know a dozen of them now the clamps are themselves are about you know ten to fifteen dollars so you'll want to get some of those for the real small gongs now you don't need those uh, necessarily because what you can do is buy a bunch of these clamps the one I showed you where you put this in and you can hang the gongs off of this piece or off of this piece it's safe I've done it for years that's how all these are hung except for these but all these are hung from these and you could tighten the crap out of them and they're not going anywhere okay so that's the other thing you can do then there's some other devices here that you can get uh, by Gibraltar they make this hook that goes into a clamp actually I'm sorry this is Minel I'm, I'm remembering wrong Minel makes some nice hardware too it's very expensive but it's a little hook and it screws into this piece and that can go on an everything rack an LP everything rack or just anything really and then you can hang a gong anywhere on your drum kit it's, these are really convenient so I have several of these things right here and the last thing that you could buy are these little cannon I believe they're cannon uh, gong holders you see one here so they go on a cymbal stand and you clamp it down and you just can hang a gong like that you can also just hang a gong from a cymbal stand uh, like up here this is one of those hooks do I have one I'm not sure yeah there it is so you see it okay like that or you could just hang it off of one so this is just to spread it out it makes it easier uh, to get even and it's more stable so that's the expensive route now the other route is to go to Home Depot and buy a bunch of pipe galvanized pipe which isn't great for plumbing anymore because it's got lead and it rusts and fills up but it's great for gong stands when I was in school at the Manhattan School of Music we made all our own gong stands and things out of that stuff this is before all these systems were available and uh, they were just beginning to flood the market in the uh, early 80s and we would just get these pipes and pipe parts and you could put together any kind of gong rack now it's not pretty looking you could paint it black and also it's not as sturdy and it's heavier so uh, these aluminum pipes are much lighter so that's the route I like also for clamps you're gonna have to come up with things you can use hose clamps but it's very very cheap so that's the other way to make gong stands but again if you have the money you can just start simple and get the big long pieces and use a hacksaw to cut them down that's my recommendation the other thing you can do uh, is hang gongs off of cymbal stands like I showed you like this the cymbal stand that I like is the heaviest stand that Gibraltar makes I'll put a picture of it here and give you the model number and it's got big long legs and then you could take a weight a stage weight like this and put it on the legs and that holds that gong you know down that symbol will not or gong will not move on that symbol stand uh, you can also use a sandbag that works great too you want to have that front leg oriented into the direction the gong is going so it can't tip over I know a lot of you know that already okay so those are my mounting details for these uh, a lot of times I'll uh, I have all these pipes I have all these clamps I'll make custom setups for particular uh, gigs all right uh, that's a lot of what I do and then I rent the stuff out I build it I find out the size of the gongs what they need or what I need and then bring it to the gig and assemble it again there so let's talk about notation and I'll put some examples here on the screen uh, there's a couple pieces I have coming up I'm doing one this week which is Madame Butterfly I told you about that in the last video that's an opera by Puccini and that uses several tune gongs so I'll show you that notation here so that's written in the bass clef and normally uh, these lower gongs are almost always going to be written in the bass clef the higher ones can go into the treble but those are your two clefs there's no alto clef or any other clef used so if you can read bass and clef, uh, treble clef then you're going to be good for reading these gong parts and basically you set up the gongs like you want if you want you could put little stickers that the audience can't see sometimes I do that to let me know what uh, it is but you're gonna have to practice it 
rarely will you be able to set it up like a piano keyboard that would be just take up the whole room so you've got to do it where you have the room it might be big small big small all right but you practice it and you get your little pattern down it's nothing too hard the puccini has only one hard excerpt i'll put it on the screen here where it goes really fast and you're you're moving around then you got to go play triangle and all that uh but nothing too difficult the other kind of notation i want to show you is the roll notation so uh and bowing notation and basically just the hit notation so we have this other piece i'm playing next week is uh the um john adams dr atomic suite it's actually an opera and uh this uh uses a lot of gongs bowed as you'll see here on the screen it's very straightforward so you see in this john adams we see the bowing looks like whole notes so when you do that you grab the bow and you're just going to bow uh, i do it towards me first and then if it's a long bow i'll i'll bow away from me just like a string player would and you want to kind of make it seamless so the crescendos you'll go a little bit faster and the decrescendos you go a little slower and you will get those overtones depending on the oops depending on the gong okay so uh the regular hits just like look like anything else it's usually on a particular line and the composer will keep that static throughout the piece no problem there a roll's normally written like a roll although sometimes it's written like 16th as you see in this excerpt that I'm putting on the screen here uh, matter butterfly so in that case it goes like this now I didn't talk too much in the last video about warming up the gun and all, and all that you don't really need to do that unless the gong is uh, 40 inches and more and if it's a chow gong that's thick you might want to touch it like this but i see people all the time warming up like wind gongs there's no reason to do that it's so thin you t it attacks on on your hit so you hear the sound right away so don't don't take that warming up thing you know where you're priming it too much and you don't need to prime suspended cymbals either i see people doing all kinds of eccentric stuff it's not necessary the only gongs you need to prime are the really giant ones because there's a delay from when you hit them and then also be careful when you prime them and by prime i mean you're tapping them and you know sometimes people can hear you do that so you don't want to do that so, um, uh, normally you're just going to take a appropriate mallet for the gong and just hit it now as far as hitting areas usually for a tam tam it's right below center in a, a gong a tuned instrument obviously it's in the center all right on the on that nipple there same thing with the opera gongs in the center that'll help you get that pitch bend which is desirable for those kinds of gongs so that's the technique pretty much and i did talk about these techniques in the last video uh finally i didn't want to bring a bucket of water in my studio because bad things happen when you bring a bucket of water into a studio but there's times when you'll have to play water gongs and what that is it's a big bucket you gotta have a lot of water and the bucket needs to be deep so you can immerse the gong in there unless it's really small uh and you'll hit the gong and then you just dip it in the water slowly and it changes the pitch very much like this it bends the pitch okay so that's not real common but i've had to do that in my career several times on some percussion ensemble pieces and orchestra pieces and you know it gets messy because you gotta dry the gong off you gotta have time to put it somewhere so if you're a composer and you want to use water gongs do us a favor give us time to pick up the gong get it in the water to hit it and then to actually take it out of the water before we're running over and playing you know a snare drum or some other part that's that i'm begging you <laughs> so if you're a composer you have to realize that these are big heavy objects and i know a lot of composers watch these videos because 
you guys have written to me, and I'm a composer as well, so I'm always thoughtful about what the percussionists have to do, and if you have a big, heavy gong in your hand, you're just not going to throw it and then run to something else. You have to put it down and don't leave a trail of water and then get to the other instrument. Uh, also, if you're a composer, give the percussionist time to switch mallets. Think about all that stuff. So I wanted to give you a close-up of some of these mallets that I use. So this first mallet it's, was made by the Encore Mallet Company. I don't know if they still make these or even if they're in business, but uh, I love this gong mallet because it's really long. It's got a cherry handle, which is very light. And it's great because I can reach up uh, if a gong's high on a rack and play it. So it's not my all-round mallet, but I use this quite a bit. So for all-round mallets, I have two of them. I use this Mike Balter mallet here, which is very heavy, great for really large chow gongs and a large Peisty symphonic. Anything over 40 inches, it works great for. Now, another mallet that I made years ago, I use a lot. This is just a plastic handle that I got in Chinatown, New York. And I wrap this myself. I used to make marimba mallets. Uh, it's really old. This thing's got to be close to 40 years old. When I was in school, I had a bunch of these. I used to sell them. So I still use this quite a bit. It's got a hockey puck inside. Uh, also, I would use casters uh, from my old trap cases that would wear out. And I replace them. Or, you know, any kind of caster works. So a wheel. And then I love this mallet I got from Mike Balter. This is really great. This is the one I use for all the shows. If you see me do Wicked or whatever, uh, I hang this on the gong. So it would be hung like this. And then it's right there for the taken. So that's a great thing to have this string on the end for those. All right, because a lot of times you don't have time to pick up a mallet. And I showed you this shorty in the last video. This one, uh, I took the top off, but it's great when you have to play two things and you don't want a, a lot of weight. It also has a really beautiful sound. So. So it works really well on wind gongs. Uh, and then you saw these Wuhan mallets. I don't use those a lot. I just took those out because uh, they come with the wind gongs or used to. Then we have these Balter mallets. I showed you these in the first video. These are vibe mallets, but they're great on tune gongs. And go back to the first video. I did a whole little demo with these. So they have big the big mushroom heads here. And then I made this chain because when we're doing John Williams or we did that movie Get Out recently with the orchestra. And he called for chains on the gong. So basically it looks like a medieval torture device. But it's great for just picking up quickly and... So it's wonderful for that. So you're not just picking up a bunch of chains. It's so easy to make. You just take an eyelet like you use for hanging things. Screw it into this... I made this uh, maple dowel on my lathe and just put some chains on there. Probably someone would charge you 50 bucks for this if you bought it, but it's super easy to make. Sometimes I use these um, these double mallets. I like these innovative percussion mallets, the IP1s. Also Vic Firth makes the swizzles. Those are fine. So yeah, those are good on opera gongs. And then triangle beaters are great for doing scrapes. So if you have a scrape, this kind of beater, which is an old Stessel, uh, they make versions of it now. And the pearl ones, I believe, the brass ones are good too. Uh, they won't scratch the gong. You just got to be careful. So they will not because the top is smooth. All right, so the last thing I wanted to show you were the Super Bowl mallets. I showed you this in my last video. I mistakenly called them the Super Bowl mallets, but they're Super Bowl mallets. And 
these are I call them lollipops because that's what they look like Mike Balter made these I'm not sure they're you know the company was bought by Vic Firth I'm not sure that um, they're still made but you'll see this in lots of movie soundtracks uh, that moaning kind of sound so So you can make it, you know, but the, the trick to it is this flexible, really thin handle. It has to flex on there, but not too much. So just enough and get a few sizes. The small ones are good. It's a higher kind of pitch, which is strange. I know, but it's true. So, so you know, the Ewoks, <laughs> I think we use these when we do all the Star Wars movies. All right. And the way that's written, it's like a glissando or they write, you know, Super Bowl mallet. And then it looks like a roll. OK, uh, you can if it's not happening, you can do one of two things. You can take some rosin and you can put some rosin on there. But also you can breathe on it like, you know, huff and puff on it. And that'll help, too. Right before you play, just breathe on it. And as far as rosin goes, I like the pops rosin. I don't have my pops here. It's at the hall, but. Uh, this is uh, just basically base rosin, and I showed you rosin up the bow in the last video. You're going to need to do that. If you're having trouble on a gong, you can try to rosin up the gong. Uh, I haven't had much success with that. Someone told me to do that, but it never really works. You just got to use the right gong, which for me is this Peisty because it's got the crazy sharp edge. And it will tear up your bow quite a bit. But you, these are cheap bows. They're synthetic. So I have about six of these. And you can get them restrung too. So any bass player can do that for you. All right. But the Pops is a really good sticky kind of rosin that works great. Don't use beeswax like for tambourines. That's not good. All right. Back to the show. So I think that's probably going to be it for this series. I covered it in two videos, which I was hoping. Uh, these are a fascinating topic gongs are just the most beautiful instruments there's lots of great videos online really high quality ones i definitely suggest you look at some of those there's even a guy playing an 80 inch peisty gong um <laughs> which is incredible i talked about it in my last video this thing is so big right you know it's it's, it's obviously uh you know over it's six feet you know seven feet or so so uh, i definitely suggest finding that you could just look up giant gong i think it's from Australia. Uh, so I'll just play a little for you uh, briefly and then we'll call it a day. 